the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. This is the story of the Pacific, the drama of the millions of people who live around this greatest sea, where the United States is now committed to a long-term policy of keeping the peace. This is the background story of the events in the Pacific and their meaning to us and to the generations to come. Australia's heavy industry. competing with the United States and Great right Britain. Why not? We can produce steel just as cheap as they can. Might be cheaper. And look at our potential market. Hundreds of millions of customers in the Pacific Basin. Yes, even in India, Africa, South America, and the Middle East. We've got the ore and the coal to do it, and that's all we need. And for good measure, we've got two other important things, spirit and enthusiasm. <laughs> Dear Dad, for a long time now, I've been wanting to write you this letter. I've had plenty of time to see Australia since I've been stationed here. And what I found out, I want you to know. Having grown up with the steel industry in America as you did, I know you'll want to hear it. In many ways, the story of Australian industry is like the story of American industry. Back in 1883, in the region of a ramshackle mining community called Silverton in New South Wales. Yes, if all the silver that is mined out of this silver barrier were gold like in California. Hey, Ernest, huh? what's that grim-looking hogback hill over yonder? It's called Broken Hill. That's strange looking, ain't it? So black and burnished, nothing but mulgar scrub growing on it. Desolate thing. Well, most people around here haven't anything but contempt for old Broken Hill. Well, I feel different about it. How's that? Well, you know, besides boundary riding, I do a little prospecting on the side. I've been over old Broken Hill pretty thoroughly. I believe that hill's practically solid black oxide of tin. Tin? Yeah. Hey, that ought to be looked into. Well, Charles Rasp and James Poole did look into this hill of tin. And soon afterwards, Rasp paid a visit to one George McCulloch, manager of the sheep station for whom Rasp worked. I'm, uh, I'm resigning, Mr. McCulloch. I'll please have my pay. <laughs> Aren't this a wee bit sudden in your part, Rusp? Oh, yes, I suppose it is. I've got a good reason. It's all on me own I want to work on. You wouldn't object to telling your old friend and employer now, would you, man? Oh, I suppose not. Fact is, I've staked out a claim on old Broken Hill. Broken Hill? That's right. <laughs> Did you really? Broken Hill? What for? What do you expect to find in that chunk of mullock? Tin, Mr. McCulloch. Tin? Really, now? That's there, all right. Quite a bit of it, too. James Poole and David James are in with me. We're going to develop it. But what with? You blokes of hard year fast in your name. We'll somehow get the necessary finances. Uh, maybe I can finance you. Tell me more about this. Well, Dad, that night at the Mount Jip Sheep Station, the first Broken Hill Company was formed. The next day, McCulloch and Rath staked out the remaining blocks on the hill. <laughs> Did you hear that George McCulloch is putting money into that black burnished hill of mullet? <laughs> Broken hill? That's a good one. He'll never get a hate me out of it. <laughs> but within a few short months, the worthless hogback landmark in New South Wales with its masses of lead and silver, was to make insignificance by comparison the already prospering silver mines in the region. 
And that infant organization, the Broken Hill Proprietary Company Limited, was to become the synonym for Australia's iron and steel industry, one of the largest in the world. About 25 years later, in 1910, when the usefulness of the Broken Hill silver and lead mines was already in sight, another very strange thing happened. At a boarding meeting of the BHP, as the Broken Hill Proprietary Company became known... Gentlemen, as you all know, for several years we have been seeking ironstone flux for our Port Piri smelters. And toward this end we have acquired from the South Australian government a lease over Iron Monarch and Iron Knob Hills. At this time, I wish to present to you Mr. H.L.Y. Brown, government geologist who has an interesting report to make. <clears throat> the report is simply this, gentlemen, that in surveying Iron Knob and Iron Monarch, I have found hitherto unsuspected quantities of iron and manganic iron ore of an unusually high grade. Please, please, gentlemen, let Mr. Brown finish. And I am finished, Mr. Darling. Except to say that I'd estimate the quantity of this ore to be in the neighborhood of 21 million tons. And gentlemen, it isn't necessary for me to tell you that the importance of Mr. Brown's discovery is something which has never been equaled in Australia. Mr. Chairman, I recommend that someone be appointed immediately to make an extended survey of iron and steel industries in Great Britain, Sweden, and the United States and to ascertain if it would be feasible for Australia to maintain such an industry. All reports were favorable toward an Australian iron and steel industry. And so BHP decided to go ahead with it at full blast. For the job of supervising the planning erection of the first BHP plant, we have selected an American, Mr. David Baker, formerly a consulting engineer in Philadelphia. May I present Mr. Baker, who will tell you about our plans. First of all, after deciding upon the best site for the industry, we'll import from the United States an iron and steel plant. We'll ship it here in pieces, lock, stock, and barrel. But here in Australia, Dad, as everywhere else, there has been trouble between management and labor. As early as 1892, the miners and the managers of the BHP were in time. You can't cut our wages down anymore. We won't stand for but it. But, men, there isn't any other way. There's a depression, and our own prices are being forced down. We won't stand for we'll it. We're strong. Yeah, we'll we'll strong. Right. Right. Some of the leaders of the striking miners were thrown in jail. Hey, you blokes read what the worker says in its editorial today? Well, listen to this. Those members of the government who support the government after its action in regard to the Broken Hill miners deserve the contumely of every white worker from one end of Australia to the other. Never was the issues clearer than at the present. And woe betide the traitors. Every labor man who supports Premier Dibbs while the government keeps these men in jail helps to rivet the fetters around his mates. He is a doggone sight meaner than the dirty scab who works in the mine. The situation simmered for the next 20 years or so, Dad. Sometimes there were lockouts on management's side. Sometimes there was rioting on labor's side. In New South Wales, the upper house, the Legislative Council, where the Conservatives had a majority, was openly hostile to Labor. And the lower house, the Legislative Assembly, where the Labor Party had a majority, was hostile to the upper house. Look here. Our bill, limiting to eight hours a day, the time a miner can work underground, has been tossed out by the Council. What? They voted it down? Yes. Voted it down? Oh, something must be done. As fast as we enact bills here in the Assembly, they knock them down in the Council. Yes. They knocked down the early closing bills. And the bill for amalgamating our banks and making our money safe. When is this going to stop? It's not going to stop until we make it stop. They even rejected the bill providing the tenants 
get a share in the value of the improvements they make in property. We've still got an ace in the hole. Yeah, plank yeah. six. Plank six. Plank six. That's right. Plank six of the labor platform. State ownership of industry. If we put this one through, we'll be working for the state, and that means working for ourselves, not BHP. Then all these benefits will come to us anyway. Yeah, they 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 By 1911, the labor movement had grown into quite a political giant in Australia, particularly the industrial state of New South Wales on the southeast coast. And it appeared that Plank 6 of the labor platform had a fair chance of going through. Gentlemen of the board of directors... As manager of BHP, I cannot too much impress upon you the necessity of defeating this movement for state ownership of the iron and steel industry in Australia. Uh, Mr. Delpratt, it seems doubly unfortunate that such a thing would even be considered by the government at this time, just when we're about to establish a private iron and steel industry. Quite right. And furthermore... I'm informed that the New South Wales government not only has appointed an English expert, Mr. F.W. Paul, to inquire into the possibilities of developing the iron and steel industry in New South Wales, but that Mr. Paul has made a favorable report that is favorable for the government and labor, unfavorable to BHP. Can you give us any details, Mr. Delpratt? Only this. The Royal Commissioner, Mr. Paul, was satisfied that in New South Wales, at Cady alone, there were deposits of ore in such immense quantities and of suitable quality as would warrant the capital outlay for the equipment of blast furnaces and an iron and steel works for manufacturing the whole of the iron and steel requirements of the Commonwealth. But could the state produce iron and steel as advantageously and as cheaply as private enterprise? Did Mr. Paul go into that? He did. He reported in that respect that existing agreements between private enterprise and the state were uh, not beneficial to the state. Then BHP is already beaten. We are beaten before we even erect our plants. That's true. We certainly can't erect plants in New South Wales and compete with the government. And New South Wales is probably the best place to erect plants because of Newcastle Coal. On the other hand... If we ship Newcastle coal to the smelters at Fort Fury in South Australia, well, even then we can't compete in the market with the government. Uh, what you say is perfectly true. But considering the present menace to BHP of a state-owned enterprise at Newcastle, then I would believe it would be better for us to um, beard the lion in his den, as it were, and establish BHP plants at Newcastle right in New South Wales. <laughs> Just, sir, uh, what do you mean, Mr. Delpratt? How do you propose to beard the state lion in his den? I'm not sure it can be done, but it's certainly worth a try. You see, I have a plan that I'd like to try. Very soon after this meeting, Mr. Del Pratt wrote a letter to the government of New South Wales in which he figuratively pointed a gun at the government. And I'd like to know if the government would be inclined to give BHP an extended lease and government land in Newcastle. And if we could count on the goodwill of the government to assist us in a friendly way. To this letter, I would appreciate a speedy reply, as we have very little time to make our decision. Respect for yours. Mm, a pretty smart gentleman, that Del Pratt, I must say. He's mighty well aware of the present decline in the Newcastle coal industry. On account of so much Michael and coal being imported. Mm -hmm. And he's also aware of Labour's grumblings to the government to do something about it. And that the coal workers will welcome an iron and steel industry in Newcastle with open arms. And that the BHP can establish a plant a lot quicker than the government because they'll have no red type to contend with. And because BHP already has a head start with their plans and machinery. <laughs> Maybe you can guess what happened after that, Dad. The New South Wales government wrote a letter to Mr. Delpratt. And let me assure you that any industry that may be established in the state of New South Wales will receive encouragement and consideration from the government. <laughs> and we Americans boast about what swell poker players we are.
But, Dad, the poker party wasn't over yet. Having raked in one big pot, KG Mr. Del Pratt started playing his cards for another in the form of what we Americans would call a fat government contract. Meanwhile, from Labor's Iron and Steel faction, if not from the coal miners, the hue and cry swelled for a state-owned iron and steel enterprise. The question was referred to a parliamentary select committee, and Mr. Del Pratt was summoned to present his side of it. This time, his bluff was even better than before. To begin with, the state has no iron deposits. And secondly, I think that when the government carries out such works, the cost is much more than if a private firm carries them out. The fact that BHP is taking up this side at Newcastle would not affect the state government in taking up another side, Mr. Delprat? No. In the event of the state government starting an iron works, would that interfere with BHP? Not in the slightest. Would it not interfere with you in the market? Mm, only in New South Wales, but that is only a small matter. How does the state cater for the federal government? The state could never get a contract if we competed against them. But in the event of the state getting it, that would interfere with you materially. Yes, I suppose if the state got a federal contract, it would mean so much less for us. But there would be plenty of scope for BHP even after that. How much of this Mr. Del Pratt himself believed is not quite clear. But his testimony had a marked psychological effect on labor itself. It seems that the state ownership plan was never so much formally abandoned as it was gradually forgotten. By 1914, when... The Archduke Ferdinand has been assassinated. This means war! Construction of the BHP Steel and Iron Works at Newcastle had progressed so far that even the world confusion and consequent dislocation of shipping couldn't hold up the great enemy. It's my great pleasure to tell you men that today the BHP has received a commendation from His Majesty for our production of steel rails urgently needed for transport on the Allied Western Front and of munition steel for the manufacture of shell bodies. You said it, mate. If it wasn't for the BHP plant at Newcastle, Australia would be without steel now. And gentlemen of the board, here is some more good news about BHP. According to the latest figures, and chiefly because of the high purity of our Australian ore... We are now producing steel at less than half the cost of imported steel. But, Dad, if the First World War had favored BHP's new iron and steel plant now, after the armistice was done... Men, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but overseas accumulations of iron and steel have now been loosed upon the Commonwealth in huge quantities. Selling prices have fallen to overseas deflation and the lower cost of manufacture. There's only one thing to do. We must cut to the bone, reduce output, and reduce the employment of you men in our plant from 5,500 to 840. Then in 1923, because of adjustments of wages and coal costs, things began to improve until 1930 and 1931, during the worldwide depression. But the next three years reflected the returning confidence of the Australian people. I'm happy to announce to you men that the demand for steel products has again so increased that the BHP plant will resume normal operations again. I must emphasize the fact that BHP and Australian heavy industry are synonymous. With a few minor exceptions, BHP is Australia's heavy industry. These Aussies aren't so dumb. Back in 1937, they began to look about them at world affairs, and particularly in Asia. I say the Japs aren't going to stop at a mere conquest of Manchuria and China. They want to carve out a whole empire in the Eastern Hemisphere. Perhaps even the world. You mean you think they have designs in Australia? I do. That is, if we make it easy for them, they'll grab whatever and as much as they can close their fists around. 
They've already indicated, well, a very keen interest, to say the least, in our huge ore deposits in Kulan and Cockatoo Islands, up in Yampi Sound in the northwest. Well, what do you recommend we do to make it uh, not so easy for them? One of the Japanese objectives in our Commonwealth would be our heavy industry. Well, naturally. And if we should lose the Newcastle area, or if the operations of the plants there should be in any way impeded, we'd be at sore lack to put up further resistance without steel. It's true. All of our iron and steel eggs are in one basket, so to speak. That's precisely my point. I believe that the iron and steel industry should be more decentralized. Another great iron and steel works established in an entirely different locality. Well, where do you propose such a site? Look at this map. I'd say right here. Why particularly there? You're thinking of Wyala? Yes, you can see it right here on this map. Oh, in South Australia? Yes, at the top of Spencer's Gulf. Hmm. Yes. You see, near Wyala, there are the great iron knob ore fields. Yes. That would minimize the shipping problem. It would be almost as economical to ship coal from Newcastle to Wyala as Wyala's ore to Newcastle. That's right. And there's the matter of security. And that is a big factor. Located on the inner reaches of Spencer's Gulf by mines and other military defenses, Wyala could be made inaccessible to the Japanese Navy. This is a great decision, as you, a steel man yourself, can understand, Dad. To erect and operate so vast a piece of industrial apparatus as a blast furnace at the edge of what is almost a desert. Today, in May 1941, as I look round me here, there stands this great industrial enterprise on which but three years ago was desolation at Bud Flats. I repeat that we Australian people can be most proud of this great contribution to the world's industry. With our new iron and steel plant here at Wyala, we can't... Then, only a few months later, on December 7th, that same year, the Japanese began their long, prepared smash southward. And the Aussies knew that their commonwealth was one of the Japanese goals. Australian heavy industry, particularly the plants at Newcastle and Wyala, sprang to life. And this great iron and steel industry gave birth to other industries. I know that you men are not shipbuilders. In fact, I suppose some of you are farmers and sheepmen. But today, we fight not only for Australia, but for freedom and the world. And a lot of the fighting is going to be done with ships. Are you willing to learn to build ships? Yeah. 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 Air warfare takes men to fly the planes. But it takes a lot more men to build them. And to build them takes a lot of learning. The learning of highly technical jobs. Do you men think you have the patience to study and learn the job? In the next few weeks, we've got the double hour output of 25 pounder shells, small shell bodies, and cheetah aircraft cylinder assemblies. Do you think you can do it? World War II transformed Australia, speeded up its industrial developments by 15 to 20 years. Almost overnight in the region of Wyala, there sprang into being large machine shops, Blacksmith's forges, electrical plants and shops, boiler factories and shipyards. Under the slogan, Fight, Work or Perish, the Aussies fell to with boundless enthusiasm. Industry, heavy and light, big and small, spurted ahead. And toward the latter months of war, when danger was past, I suppose the Australian people couldn't help but look ahead to a post-war commonwealth through rose-colored glass. We can do it. The war's proved it. Why? We've got mass production established in industries that never even existed here before the war. Think of it. A country that never before built an automobile, and we turned out thousands of tanks and armored cars and planes, including the motors. And 53 types of radios, giant searchlights, 75 types of ammunition. And every main type of gun. I'll say we can do it. And now that the Aussies have proved they can do it, new days lie ahead. Probably difficult days, but brighter days. Australian industry faces a brighter future than ever before. 
The federal government has just put in hand the tremendous job of relaying the rails of all Australian railroads. 27,000 miles. All the multiple gauges in the different states will be unified. This will mean almost complete remaking of all Australian rolling stock. And Australian iron and steel will be used for the job. The shipyards are being kept in production, too. Yes, and the aircraft factories, open during the war, have been guaranteed contracts to supply both combat and commercial aircraft for the Empire. Soon, Australia will be making its own automobiles. Our big hope is in the markets which geographically should belong to us. Especially if the people who live in these places, like the Netherlands Indies and India, get something like a fair share of the wealth of their countries. The question is largely one of how quickly these countries recover from the effects of the war. So the industrial future, as it looks to me, is bright. The other day I talked with an Australian journalist. Australia has a long way to go to real industrialization. Well, how would you or, or could you compare Australia's progress with America's? Precise parallels are impossible, of course. But roughly speaking, I'd estimate that six years ago, just prior to the war, Australia was industrially advanced about as far as the United States was in 1860. Whew. That was quite a long time ago in American industrial history. Today, we are probably at the stage where you were around the turn of the century. That's progress. We weren't any industrial midget then. Indeed not. And relatively, we are gaining, compressing many aspects of the years. Well, do you think you'll ever overtake? Oh, I wouldn't make any such wild speculation as that. It's interesting to observe that until very recently, we were almost entirely what you once were before you became an industrial nation, a primary producer. Our chief products were and still are wool, butter, farm produce, hide. And wheat. This year, we're aiming at 200 million bushels of wheat. There is one other side to the picture that I've scarcely touched upon, Dad. And it's, in my opinion, tremendously important. This is the indomitable spirit and enthusiasm of the Aussies. We can do it. You bet we can. We've got everything we need. Plenty of all left in South Australia. Millions of more tons up there on Cockatoo Island in Northwest Australia. And another big concession. 30 million tons in New Caledonia. Give us the people and we'll find the markets for our goods. So you see, Dad, it's full steam ahead for Australia. And that's the reason I'm going to stay here and work out my destiny in the industry of Australia. As you worked out your destiny in America, I want to work out mine here. I know you'll understand. All the best to you. Your loving son, Joe. have been listening to the Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. May I repeat? For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin the University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The Pacific Story is produced and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. The role of Joe was played by Hank McCune. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.